This panel, um, Alexander and Gerga will introduce, but I just want to introduce Alexander Arroyo, Gerga Basic, who are my own close comrades and collaborators. We have a small research lab, the Urban Theory Lab, which we are setting up here, and um, been with us for a couple years now, and delighted to have you both um, working in different um, fields of critical spatial media, critical cartography, and much more, which they will shortly introduce. So over to you. Thank you, Neil, and welcome um, to our second panel of the day on speculative geographies and spatial media. Uh, before I introduce our panelists, I would just like Alexander to give short remarks on our topic today. So th this is a little bit more formal than Gary's introduction uh, for the earlier session. But given that it's not entirely clear what speculative geographies or spatial media might mean, let's, let's dive into that for a moment. So, whether it's sea level rise or floods or atmospheric rivers most recently, especially if you're coming from California, uh, the, these cataclysmic images of, of climate change, and they are properly cataclysmic, uh, are increasingly mediated by a sort of parallel deluge of geospatial and environmental data. And it's not only that these data have been growing exponentially in volume or that remote and other kinds of sensing platforms have been growing in, at the same pace, nor only that satellite images and climate model visualizations uh, are now commonplace aesthetic experiences. But that has become really clear with the recently released IPCC synthetic report, for example. We're both really overwhelmed and often anesthetized to those data. But to fixate on the quality or the quantity of these data is to miss a more subtle but perhaps profound transformation that these are not just spatial data but spatial media. So let me explain what I mean there. So we're borrowing the term here from feminist digital geographers Sarah Elwood and Agnieszka Leszczynski, who coined it to describe the mediums, and I'm quoting here, the mediums that enable, uh, extend, or enhance our ability to interact with and create networked geographic information, unquote. So while cr critical scholars of, of spatial media, uh, not the least of, among them are here at this table, um, have investigated how the networked character of these media engender new modes of knowledge production and power, the kinds of data and the ways that they're related are still very much in formation. So there's an openness here, not just to new opportunities for critique, but for experimentation. And that's really something that this panel tries to stage, is this shift from perhaps a more sort of critical mode of inquiry towards a more experimental and speculative one. So what's crucial here is that these spatial media are in that sense not just a means for more precise analysis of environmental emergency and its emergent environments, but also for speculative and perhaps radically different geographic imaginaries of landscape histories and climate futures alike. So in that context, this session tries to ask how might these experimental approaches to spatial media help us create alternative modes of geographic speculation? Ones that not only explore possible futures of climate crisis, or its alternatives, but also its hidden pasts and present spatial relations. So how can these approaches braid together critical research, aesthetic practices, and political movements toward the worlds that we want? In other words, how might they engender new modes of mapping altogether? Now, this question of mapping is actually very important for SIGU and for this panel in particular. Uh, this is something that came up in, in one of our earlier discussions when we were chatting on Zoom in preparation for this panel. But mapping is something that we can return to as part of the broader history of geographic thought at UChicago specifically. So geography has long been one of the most intellectually and methodologically omnivorous disciplinary traditions. But as some of you already probably know, the geography department here at UChicago, which was the nation's first and one of its most prestigious, uh, shuttered in 1986. And it was partially reconstituted in committee form, including what now is SIGU. So there's a much more nuanced story to be told here uh, about the closure of geography departments uh, at many private institutions as well uh, across the US. Uh, but one of the most consequential effects has been the making of a kind of intellectual and disciplinary diaspora, with spatial research and practice finding homes in other departments and traditions. 
So it's in this kind of post-disciplinary context that SIGU brings together scholars of geography, landscape, place, and space from a whole variety of backgrounds and areas of research. And the breadth of methodological and thematic expertise represented by SIGU opens up a unique and really timely opportunity to revive dialogue on questions of spatial research and practice. So alloyed with the specific urgency and clarity of SIGU's focus on the societal and spatial dimensions of climate change, biodiversity loss, and other kinds of environmental transformations, SIGU occasions this sort of reconvening and reconsideration of our collective practices across spatial media methods and pedagogy. And so this, this conference, and this panel in particular, offers up one exploratory forum for what we hope is a resurgent and robust discussion on these themes. And we hope it's the first of many. So I'll turn it back to Gerga to introduce our distinguished panelists. Thank you. Thanks for the framing. Um, so uh, we're going to hear uh, first from Xiaowei Wang, um, uh, who is an artist, writer, organizer, and coder. Uh, they are the author of the book Blockchain, Chicken Farm, and Other Stories, Stories of Tech in China's Countryside. Uh, it's a 2023 National Book Foundation Science and yeah. Literature Award winner. Um, their writing has appeared in Tank, Transmediale, The Nation, and more. Currently, they are one of the stewards um, of the Logic School, an organizing community of, uh, for tech workers and a research fellow at the UCLA Center on Race and Digital Justice, and a senior civic media fellow at USC Anneberg. Uh, welcome. Uh, then we're going to uh, hear from Shannon Mattern. Uh, Shannon Mattern is a Penn Presidential Compact Professor of Media Studies and History of Art at the University of Pennsylvania. Um, sh uh, her writing and teaching uh, focus on archives, libraries, and other media spaces, uh, media infrastructures, and spatial epistemologies. Uh, she is the author of um, four books. Uh, two most recent ones are Code and Clay, Data and Dirt, 5,000 Years of Urban Media, and A City is Not a Computer. Um, she also contributes a regular uh, long-form column about urban data and mediated infrastructures uh, to Places Journal. And finally, uh, we're going to hear from Joe Gouldy, uh, who is Associate Professor of History at Southern Methodist University and Director of the Digital Humanities Minor. Um, she's, the, she's also the author of four books. Um, Two most recent ones are um, The Long uh, Land War, The Global Struggle for Occupancy Rights, and the forthcoming one, uh, The Dangerous Art of Text Mining. Um, her historical work ranges from archival studies in nation building, state formation, and the use of technology by experts. Um, she's also a practicing data scientist and has been a pioneer in the field of text mining for historical research. Welcome, everyone. And we can start with Shawe. Thank you so much um, for that generous introduction and for having me today. Um, so can everyone hear me OK? Yeah, OK. So today, my presentation is titled Towards the Impossible Image. Um, and so it's actually a geography that I would say has been haunting me for quite some time. Um, and I think the best way to enter into this geography actually is um, to go to uh, a short film that I made some time ago. Yes, 
その枠はちゃっちゃでぬいぬいあかまいなかまあいな金は勝ちけんよわひめは葉っぱえこふうそろってともかせにそのわけはちゃっちゃでぬいぬいはなはな明日はさんびじゃよわひねをつれてあいかねほほんとびかきよかそのわけはちゃっちゃでぬいぬい So what you heard there was actually a type of music called Hole Hole Bushi, um, and it's sung by Haruo Kasahara. So Hole Hole Bushi is actually songs from former plantation workers, specifically Japanese plantation workers in Hawaii at around the end of the 1800s and the beginning of the 1900s. And the songs are often in Japanese, but quite often multilingual, so mashups of Japanese, Hawaiian, as well as some Tagalog. Um, and this is a history that the historian Franklin Odo, along with her music teacher Harry Arata, has really um, uh, kept alive. And the images that you saw in the film are actually images of seeds and flowers taken under a microscope. Um, and all of those seeds and flowers are from a small farm that was based in Bolinas, California. Um, that's a small farm, as you can see on the map, in this small town that's actually located on the Pacific Plate, not the North American Plate. Um, the town itself has a tendency towards mythologies, settler culture, and gossip. So as a result, I can't actually say the name of the farm. Um, but it was started by a young Asian American farmer who began um, this farm actually because uh, their great grandparents were farmers who became dispossessed of the land because of the alien land laws in California that were enacted in 1913. Um, the alien land laws still persist in some states today. But when I talked to this farmer, um, they really saw their work in some way as uh, reparative in a sense. Um, but of course, there's an irony to how we think of stories and then the deeper structures in time, right? Um, because of the drought and water crisis, this farmer was actually, and also um, the local culture there where they ran into a lot of tensions with some of the longstanding white farms in the area. Um, they were actually forced to leave Bolinas and um, had to move their farm elsewhere. Um, in addition, of course, uh, a lot of the barriers that are brought about um, for small farmers um, in, and USDA grants that end up actually not helping them out so much. So how are these alien land laws and hole, hole bushi and the impossible image connected? So it turns out, um, like much of Californian history, they're connected through these threads of land, settler control of land, and plantation afterlives. Um, and so I'm thinking uh, specifically of those ways of counting, um, classification that Achille Membe talks about, um, as well as uh, the ecological afterlives that Anna Singh talks about. And so I'll discuss this, um, these threads through this ongoing project. It's very uh, nerve wracking to present <laughs> work in progress, but this is a work called Witch Fever. Um, and it's uh, the ways that the impossible image is an image that enacts desire and uh, intimate geographies. Um, so it's really this trans-Pacific journey through space um, and time that leads me to a lot of the same grooves in the riverbed of what Robin D.G. Kelly would call sedimented histories. Um, and in this project, Witch Fever, which is a speculative art project in many ways, um, 
I'm interested in the ways that the speculative is not just another way um, or tool of colonizing the future, but can be a way to really tune in, to ground us um, in the very real and ongoing relationships between labor, um, land, and climate. And that speculation itself um, can be actually a way of creating intimate geographies. So I'm very inspired often by what Audre Lorde's uh, provocation, that there are new, no new ideas, there are simply new ways of making them felt. So the alien land laws, um, they have a complex long history um, in California itself, um, enacted in 1913. Um, and a lot of this having to do actually with the influx of former plantation workers in Hawaii who would end up in California after their contracts were done. Um, and so in the 1910s, uh, two thirds of the Japanese immigrant population in uh, California were actually farmers. Um, and by 1920, Japanese immigrant farmers controlled more than 450,000 acres of land in California and were responsible for 10% of the state's crop revenue at the time. Um, but you can see there's already a sense, you know, when I think about the young farmer who was essentially forced out of Bolinas, um, these threads of labor and who is allowed to um, steward or versus own land um, versus even uh, having a right to that kind of history of farming, right? Um, and I always uh, show this image because um, as I was looking into the alien land laws, I think there's always an emotional component for me of the archive where, you know, the Commonwealth Club is still exists in San Francisco and I walk by it fairly often. And to see these kind of um, narratives around immigration, race, population, um, classification, um, just so commonplace at the time. And it always reminds me of like in the present, what is the work that we're doing and what are the narratives that are at stake, right? So in this geography, I um, felt like I wanted to move beyond actually just the plan view map. Um, this is a map of the Hawaiian Islands from um, actually the Wailua, uh, plantation um, kind of guidebook um, where they, you know, sold the uh, positive benefits of their plantation on Oahu uh, to um, the general public as well as potential workers. And so you can see um, also it's a multilingual map kind of uh, trying to pull in uh, more uh, Japanese, plant Japanese workers for the plantations. Um, and this is another map of the plantation itself and how much of the island of Oahu it took up. And so there was this kind of corporate literature embedded in trying to figure out these histories. Um, but then there was another you know, history and medium that um, through the process of research I became really fascinated by. So this comes from the Barbara Kawakami collection from the Japanese American National Museum. And she was a seamstress. And her way of collecting stories and trying to understand the lives of these plantation workers was actually through clothing. Um, so she has this enormous extensive collection. Um, on the left, you can actually see one of the jackets from her collection. So it would just be people giving her this clothing. Um, oftentimes, if a certain piece wasn't available um, because she was a seamstress through conversations and interviews with uh, former plantation workers, she would actually go on to recreate a lot of this clothing. Um, and actually looking at it as a form of material history, it was also, to me, a very intimate geography. It turned out that a lot of the first wave of plantation worker clothing was um, when the Japanese plantation workers, they came over with kimonos. So you see like this kind of ikat cursory fabric. Um, they would just remake their kimonos into workwear. But then as people settled in more and you know, tried to serve through their contracts and became intertwined with the plantation economy, started buying up more fabrics right, that were available um, uh, at the plantations, at the store. And so you see this kind of very printed industrial uh, pattern, botanical pattern. 
And so to me, I became really um, drawn to this, this kind of intimacy of this fabric of botanical prints and also the legacy of you know, uh, colonial botany in these prints. And so, of course, really thinking about William Morris and how William Morris prints were really um, the ways that colonialism and empire became embedded into these everyday elements of metropolitan Britain, right? Um, and so thinking about like how this kind of intimate geography might cloak um, or hide structures of power and domination um, and what are the ways that we can actually unearth that um, or I don't, I hesitate to use the word subvert, but potentially subvert that. Um, and as I looked through so many of these William Morris prints, um, you know, made throughout the late 1800s, um, thinking about it as around the same time as the uh, sugarcane plantations in Hawaii, um, there was like a very hallucinatory effect to these prints, um, you know, very Charlotte Perkins Gilman, like the yellow wallpaper. Um, they were actually uh, often printed with arsenic, so they did lead to actual uh, hallucinations. Um, and, you know, this um, idea of the impossible image as really enabling those prints, right? So um, really coming from the historian uh, Danielle Blackmar, who writes about it, Invisible Empire, that botanical images um, are actually these very strange impossible images because they depict a plant at like all different seasons of its, you know, life. So it's like spring, like a spring leaf and a summer flower and you know, another different part of the season. Um, but it's this kind of universality that's depicted in one image um, and also the erasure of the knowledge and the labor that allowed colonial botanists to even quote unquote discover these species, right? Um, and so I think there's such like a rich intimacy to these um, prints that I really wanted to explore. So um, I always have to clarify, I did not make images using Dolly. I just used it, used, uh, made, made uh, a tool that I used in this project was really old, fas old fashioned AI where you use PyTorch and you code things into a notebook. Um, but I was interested in the ways that, you know, this kind of feature extraction using AI um, could be a form of tuning in. So what, um, Jeff Warren calls um, in his body of work instruments for multiple worlds, like really kind of tuning in and surfacing rather than that kind of constant act of like discovering, right, and classifying. Um, so taking archival images and then actually a William Morris print, extracting those images and using that to really kind of hallucinate a speculative botany. So um, I worked with a botanical illustrator to actually discuss like the different ecologies, um, you know, and like the pollinators, the root structures, um, you know, all of these things that would be present um, in, for example, this is a Cecil plantation in Hawaii that was the source image. And then the second source image was a William Morris print. And then it kind of um, using the help of AI to like hallucinate this new print. And then from that print, um, kind of sifting through and finding this um, very much this like speculated flower. So it's not real, um, but it was a very, um, it was a very power, it was a powerful series of conversations with the botanical illustrator and trying to kind of reverse engineer these flowers. Um, so this is a, uh, plant, a chin, chinchona plantation um, from uh, Indonesia. And then the speculative botany that appears from there. Um, taking a you know, source image of a rubber plantation, um, really pairing that with this kind of very traditional William Morris print. Um, and this is like the hallucinated uh, print. And then from there, really extracting out um, that that speculative botany. And then this is this is the last one that I'll show. But you know, um, back to uh, the uh, women plantation workers. Um, 
and uh, you know uh, where they were working in Hawaii um, and coming to this other new uh, totally imagined um, flower and its associated pollinators. Um, so I'll just end here where, uh, again, it's a work in progress. And so I'm actually printing these patterns um, onto fabric and trying to, uh, so paper flower making is actually like quite an old uh, art that I won't get into, but this kind of recreation of um, these uh, speculated flowers into paper. And so I think I'm really interested, you know, to kind of end here is in the ways that actually looking back into the past um, and this form of speculation can also start to provoke certain questions about origin or history or where we begin timelines. Um, throughout the course of researching this project, um, you know, uh, I'm thinking specifically of this recent article from Dr. Keolu Fox, um, where he's talking about Red Hill in Oahu. So um, all these layered histories of sugarcane plantations as well as the military industrial complex. And he kind of provokes that maybe climate change began um, as early as the 1700s as, you know, with Captain Cook or as early as Columbus. Um, and so I think these forms of speculation, thinking about speculation otherwise, feel important to me, especially when to return to the young farmer in Bolinas and kind of essentially getting chased out of town under um, a water crisis. I think it also points to the ways that we might think about moving forward, right? And um, their kind of intervention when uh, thinking about the past as repair. And I'm trying to and I think alongside that, what are the other openings and strategies and different ways we might uh, act in the world? Um, so I'll end there. Uh, thank you so much. I'll pass it back to So I too want to thank all the organizers for uh, putting this event together, for inviting me to take part. And it's also been a really nice opportunity to meet people I've known only virtually, uh, to meet you in person for the first time. And I look forward to meeting others and you um, for the rest of the day today. I'm also presenting a brand new project too. So it's to understand the, the nerves that come along with that. Um, at dinner last night, we were discussing just the riot of graphs that were present in Holly Jean's presentation yesterday, just the visual language that is so often associated with climate change, the bar curve, the bar chart, uh, the infographic that shows how climate capture is supposed to happen, for instance. So what are the visual rhetorics of these forms of um, visual communication that we see so frequently attached to or associated with climate change? And I think that's a theme that will probably, well, I'm, given the title of the panel, I'm sure will come up. It was a, a nice, auspicious connection between what I'm going to be talking about and the presentation, the keynote from last night. I also, uh, we were encouraged in organizing this panel to focus on method and pedagogy. And uh, my research and teaching are always connected. I often write about stuff that I'm trying to work through in finding ways to express complicated topics or wicked problems to students, for instance. And one way I often do that is by starting small. Um, by uh, using uh, artifact analysis, having people take a really tiny thing and see how it explodes into a larger system, like a flower, how a flower can be emblematic of a larger history of colonialism, for instance. And I've been doing this for a long time, but a couple years ago, um, uh, Joe Dumit, some of you might know, wrote a piece called about the drawing from Donna Harway, um, proposing a they call the implosion method, where you have students, or not even students, researchers, choose a tiny thing to see how it can both um, uh, global forces, massive histories, kind of implode into that one object. So by starting having a home base, a concrete thing to come home to, it really helps to center and provide some sense of coherence to a really expansive form of investigation. So if we're thinking about methodology and pedagogy, I think this is a really useful potential strategy, especially for teaching some of the issues that we're talking about today. Um, I also thought that um, Helen Ann's presentation from the previous panel, I just put this slide in a couple minutes ago about seeds. They're one of those charismatic objects that really, again, is a very nice way to lend itself to this type of methodology. I was intrigued by these ideas. I love that you mentioned seed libraries. Um, 
A lot, of, a lot of my work is about libraries and archives, especially the non-conventional type. So several years ago, I went to the, um, oh, I'm blanking on the name of it right now, but it's the, um, the Sediment Core uh, Library or Archive at Columbia University and looked at the history of, not only the history, but multiple examples of uh, tree ring libraries, coral libraries, sediment, ice cores, etc., and how these are sources of big data and what it means to be an archive of a non kind of um, non uh, fixed record, for instance. So, just drawing some nice connections. So, thank you for setting that up. But I'm going to focus on a different kind of not so small object, but a very charismatic object that we can definitely branch, pun intended, out from the tree. Um, so we see this manifested especially in the discourses of climate change on a grand scale, whereas in the charismatic object um, uh, scales up into a global strategy, which we see of, as was again mentioned last night, in the um, ubiquity of tree planting campaigns, of which there are myriad manifestations, all aestheticized and granted pathos appeal through majestic photography and maps, in many cases, as you see here or in documentaries like uh, Rita Leisner's Forest for the Trees, which portrays the camaraderie of a tree planting troupe in Western Canada. So you see the, the friendships, the romances, the sweat, the dirtiness, the really satisfying exhaustion that you feel by planting trees all day. Um, and a bit somewhat romantic, so it is, so it does serve the purpose of romanticizing somewhat this work of planting trees. And of course, various scientific bodies have marshaled spatial data as the, at the regional or global scale to frame tree planting as an empirically good thing, which of course has been questioned, as many of us know as well, but <clears throat> they often used to kind of uh, to serve rhetorically to support the need and the value of this type of practice. Data are also, spatial data are also occasionally transformed into broader strategies of technological solutionism. As we see in, uh, I think I might be one slide ahead or one slide behind, there it is, okay. Uh, as we see in projects like Dendra, which performs ecosystem analysis and reporting and then deploys drones for strategic planting, often in remote environments. So here we're using the map and various forms of spatial data to provide a very techno-vegetal solutionist approach to climate change. Data-driven solutionism is also apparent in projects like Living Carbon, a biotech company founded by folks formerly associated with OpenAI and DuPont, interesting kind of uh, artificial intelligence and in the chemical industry, to genetically engineer trees that offer lots of measurable qualities, bigger, faster, stronger, which appeal to reformers seeking quantifiable outcomes. Uh, trees also become quantitative variables in carbon markets, again, something that Holly Jean mentioned last night. So this is all uh, tapping into the, the um, convenience of being able to use trees as a quantifiable object which then lends themselves to deployment in myriad strategies. They're also mappable anchors in plotting out more sustainable supply chains as we see in projects like Canopy. Tree data are also emblematic of other forms of virtue, in this case, social equity. We can map tree, urban tree canopy as a proxy for environmental justice, and there are several initiatives that do this. This might connect to the urban panel that's later on today. Uh, the organization American Forests has made this correlation explicit in the form of what they call a tree equity score, which obviously uses cartography, as you can see here, to indicate where trees can be strategically deployed to address myriad social injustices. So there's um, uh, actually Sam Block wrote a really great piece in Places Journal a few years ago connecting uh, the shade, the article is actually called Shade, looking at shade as seemingly this kind of accidental ambient phenomenon, but it is... Uh, a product of, a correlate of, emblematic of much larger issues of social equity and urban planning. And through various forms of social media, social, sorry, through various forms of spatial media, including pathos-soaked renderings like this one, we're convinced that each tree in the ground brings us one degree closer to justice. Yet, of course, there's a great deal of doubt that such techno-vegetal solutionism is effective, and these are just a few of myriad articles questioning in particular tree planting campaigns. There's a long history, exemplified by the rise of scientific forestry in the 18th century, where trees have been instrumentalized as solutions to larger problems. We can see tree as method or tree as instrument embodied in these images, both at the macro and micro scale. Just as we see tree as quantifiable commodity, as exhaustible resource illustrated in images like this. 
The artistic duo Cooking Sections, some of you might be familiar with them, made this um, arboreal logic palpable, experiential, and habitable in a 2019 exhibit at Columbia University, which critiqued the notion that trees are a means to offset, uh, to, in financially calculable terms, the deleterious effects of ecological degradation. Trees excuse us from having to address root, again, pun intended, causes. Notably, these trees have no roots. This Arboreal arithmetic is merely one example of trees millennium spanning existence as epistemological objects or things to think with. I've explored tree thinking in a piece I published in Places Journal a couple years ago and through the metaphor of grafting, which was really a salient uh, framing device that I used in the introduction and conclusion to my a City is Not a Computer book. There, I look at the long history of trees as graphic tools or media for information architecture, for classification, and the algorithmization of decision making. I'll also note that Eilat um, Even Ezra exam excuse me, Ezra, that's right, Eilat Even Avon Ezra examines medieval practices of tree diagramming in law, medicine, and rhetoric in myriad other fields. Even today, trees are models for computational operations. So those, though they're all kind of in, in, in their essence analog objects, their physical form has become a foundational mode of organization for computational projects as well. Here in the form of a decision tree algorithm. And here in the form of a random forest, another type of algorithm, which as its name implies, involves running multiple decision trees simultaneously to provide an algorithmic forest. We can even use these arboreal algorithms in managing analog forests, as Lindsay Wickstrom proposes in her recently published book, Designing the Forest, where she uses various forms of spatial media, from maps to axonometric diagrams to infographics, to advocate for using computational tools to promote more sustainable forestry and environmentally friendly mass timber construction. She also addresses some labor issues in, that, uh, in this book as well, which was a theme in the previous panel. Media scholar Jennifer Gabris and her Citizen Sense team at Cambridge University also deploy various computational tools, including probably decision trees and random forests, to gather and render spatial data that can help us better understand and steward our forests. You can see here the various media forms the team uses. The type might be very tiny for you, and it's microscopic on my screen, so I can't really even read what it says. Um, so they're using various forms of uh, meet spatial media and their various applications from observations to optimization to encouraging community participation and affecting regulatory change. So these are all the different ways that they're using different spatial media, the different um, climate change related ends or applications that they're proposing. Not actually proposing, actually doing. So yet trees themselves are also media forms, not only in the sense that they've yielded substrates for paper, papyrus, etc., are many communication media throughout history. Trees are also repositories of data about environmental and social history. Of course, we all know about tree rings as a form of analog data visualization or organic data storage. Xylotex, or maybe kind of one of those impossible images that Xiao Wei was talking about, another form of botanic media or organic data repository that allows researchers to gather tree specimens and artifacts representing their entire immediate ecology and then put them together into a box that's actually made from the specimen of the tree itself. You might even regard the xylotech as a form of sampling or organic data compression. These various arboreal media tell us not only about themselves, but also about their social ecologies, about their long-standing coexistence with other species and human stewards, as we can see with a lot of indigenous forestry, for instance. And the better we are at reading organic media, the more we learn about the biochemical communication networks that exist within and between our various sylvan citizens themselves. As we try to find new media to represent these sylvan networks, whether network diagrams, as we see here, or screen prints, whose superimpositions embody organic entanglements. Um, and to close, I'll explore just a few additional spatial media that capture other methods of understanding trees and forests and their relationships to cl the climate crisis. Not the climate crisis, climate crisis, but an article. So the first is Forma Phantasma's Cambio at Serpentine Gallery in 2020 explored the governance of the timber industry, and it deployed different media forms that captured the myriad ontologies of the tree. Uh, maps, close-up, um, kind of microscopic diagrams, uh, satellite imagery, uh, organic samples, all different types of media. 
um, and they wanted to explore how these various media compel us to regard the tree as a particular type of entity, which elicits particular methods of engagement and degrees of investment or responsibility. In their video, Seeing the Wood for the Trees, the artists have staged a kind of trade show in the middle of the forest, juxtaposing machine vision and green screens and performance dashboards with archival documents that record colonial legacies. The result is a powerful argument blending datafied and embodied ways of knowing for community forest rights. When considering spatial media, I think it's also important to look beyond the visual and the representative to think about sound and speculation, as Xiao Wei talked about as well. I recently moved to Philadelphia from New York to start a new job at Penn, um, and I um, had learned about this project even before my move, but I'm, I'm very especially glad to be now in close proximity to its practitioners. It's called the Street Word Project, another pun with tree kind of bracketed out in the middle of it, um, which f uh, features many programs that explore Sylvan Sonics as a medium of representation and a method of engagement and a productive metaphor for climate activism. So what does it mean to broadcast sound and broadcast trees? How much you find parallels between sonic metaphors that maybe do things differently than our m m primarily ocular-centric ways of representation allow for? And then perhaps drawing inspiration from the tradition of acoustic ecology, which some of you might know about, um, some colleagues at King's College London have begun collecting soundscapes as an analyzable data set and an aesthetic palette for interdisciplinary research on issues pertinent to climate man or to um, uh, forest management and the climate crisis. We can audition a small sampling of such forest escapes at the sound archive tree.fm, which combines photographs and audio recordings to allow us to view and listen to several forests around the world. The site's tagline is listen to a random forest, not the algorithm kind of random forest, but actually a literal random forest. Um, we hear the rustling leaves of Ataturk Arboretum in Istanbul, the bird song of Bitsa Nature Park in Mas Moscow, and the rushing water of a coastal forest in Ibiza. Here, the randomness isn't about parallel computational processing. Instead, it's a kind of a grounded sublimity, a sensation of poetic disorientation as we allow the algorithm to transport us from one sylvan soundscape to the next, appreciating their acoustic and ecological diversity. And I'll close with one final example, a product, or pro, not a product, a project that exemplifies the entanglements of environmental loss and digital erasure and the possibility of their mutual preservation. Jacqueline Wu, a graduate of Parsons' MFA program in design and technology, came to see me a few years ago to discuss her artificial arboretum project, which, uh, studied in, um, which aims to study and preserve fauna from a planetary proxy. Oops, was that mine? It's mine. Okay, sorry. So she began by harvesting trees from Google Earth, performing photogrammetry on each, and then transforming each into a digital and physical 3D model. Her scans, she says, capture not only the geometry of the trees, but also their age, seasons, shadows, and surrounding environments. She uses these photogrammetries, I'm just realizing how full of puns this talk is, <laughs> photogrammetries, to construct a taxonomy encompassing not those qualities we typically find in a field guide, for instance, but the digital fauna's geolocation, its access state, file size, texture maps, and mesh data. Within the Arboretum, those specimens are then organized into what she uh, has organized them into biomes that reflect the quirks of their digital ontologies. So looking at how they're represented in Google Earth just because of the kind of the um, uh, accidents of their digital representation, we could visit the grove of gravitational defiance. The trees are just magically floating in Google Earth or the forest of false positives or the island of inconsistent existences. So this is really kind of making a feature of all these digital glitches of representation. While Wu's trees and their digital worlds are endangered by new map data and software updates, their counterparts in the material world are threatened by a changing climate and the spread of development and myriad other forces. Quote, in a society that strives for pixel-perfect digital commodities, Wu, em Wu embraces her specimen's wonderful deformities, her words, their lossiness, both digital and existential. And those losses are entangled. The expansion of energy intensive co computational systems contributes to climate collapse, which in turn transforms these terrains those computer models aim to represent and threatens their material apparatus, the sensors and cables and archives underlying those digital maps. So it's all entangled. You wanna use more digital data to help to address the climate change, you're actually exacerbating the climate crisis through the energy intensive use of digital data. Wu also demonstrates the losses and gains in conceiving the planet through a computational lens. 
We might not be able to sit in the shade beneath the trees, um, beneath her trees once they've been displaced by a parking lot, for instance, but we can access the vector data of their shadows. There were ones there, but that's not really good enough. Perhaps we should save the tree itself rather than settling for its digital proxy. And not just one tree, but forests full of them. Such ambition requires the judicious use of data and computation and a critical understanding of their ecological impacts. The choice between a tree and a photogrammetry is based on striking a careful balance between loss and preservation, between immediate desire and future survival, between data centers and dry tundras, silicon chips and salt flats. Thank you. So I will echo everyone else's thanks to the organizers, but also to my fellow panelists and also to the rest of you. This is the most fertile convening of minds that I've ever been at in a conference. And I'm just, I've been using this phrase, it's not very polite to say in front of the mic, but let it be recorded. I feel like a pig in shit. <laughs> So I'm, uh, I'm going to propose my own speculative geography, and I want to continue the themes. This is the most liquid and continuous panel I've, all, I've been on, also do credit to the organizers. So I will take off exactly where my co-panelists left off on the theme of data and how the era of climate change is also the era of big data. It's the era of the triumph of STEM education and the decline of the humanities, of large language models and Bitcoin. The era of climate change is the era of data. Data drives IPCC policies and climate pledges. Data provides reassurances that wealth management funds the world over have eyes on the problem. And as we have seen, data is also part of the problem. The servers that produce the critique eat up, so all, eat up energy and produce more carbon. Uh, the data is biased. Um, and the conventions that are supposed to constrain carbon emissions have met and met as carbon emissions only mount further. The data is part of the problem. But the age of data has at least one more promise beyond making visible the invisible or offering a platform cr for critique. Lively exchanges of data can make possible an advance of democracy, an interaction by and supportive of the values of diversity and diverse engagement. Democratic Ecology, in Vandana Shiva's idiom, describes a commitment to environmental protection compatible with a framework of democracy in which the values of diversity and dissent are supported. This talk describes three experiments with critical thinking about data in the service of democratic ecology. It's intended as a kind of science fiction speculation about a world in which data supports not hierarchy but moral economy based in the shared premise of our common responsibility for and dependence upon natural resources. The question of whether or how the circulation of information can support democracy has at least a century of historical precedence behind it. In the era that followed the Second World War, many experts became enthusiastic about the prospect of a participatory revolution in data that would change the business of how government was conducted in favor of both efficiency and personal liberty. An attitude summed up in Frederick Hayek's, I know, seminal 1945 essay, The Use of Knowledge in Society, where he advocated for the efficiency of the man at the pier over the bureaucrat at the office. In the dozens of experiments with participatory knowledge of the 20th century, radicals took up the promise of information as a vector of participation for reforming relationships in and to the landscape. Peer-to-peer -peer geographical information became a tool for reforming rent, for example, in the Appalachian Land Ownership Survey of 1981. Others saw participatory maps as a tool for correcting the ejection of indigenous people from territory, a vision articulated in an experiment with Cree territory documented in Hugh Brody's 1982 study, Maps and Dreams, the image from which we see on the left. More recently, 
Environmental activists like the American Outfit Public Lab have used participatory data collection to make visible pollution in the Gowanus Canal. The cutting edge of pra the practice comes not from the US, it comes from Taiwan, where Minister of Information Audrey Tang has presided over the participatory mapping of both COVID and air pollution. Now I read these experiments as undertakings in creating control for working class and diverse communities over the organs of the reproduction of everyday spatial life. Although not, with the exception of the last, the reproduction of climate change. So the question becomes, can we make the data of, participatory, of climate change participatory, dem democratic, diverse, and a zone of dissent? And how would we do it? Today, I want to share three experiments in shifting those practices. My first case, is an experiment in what Michael Gaddis has called the practice of auditing or using data to turn a critical eye on institutions. In this case, the institution is the US Congress and the method of the audit is text mining or the use of word count at AI to critically inspect discourses used by or invented by the members of the US Congress when they talk about the environment and environmentalists. We can use word embeddings to track the changing speech of members of Congress since 1970, when the neologism environmentalism first appeared in the annals of Congress. Environmentalism wasn't fixed discourse, as proved by the, this table of top collocates and phrases per five-year period. The names of the industries implicated in environmentalism changed from period to period, from coal to forestry, to, from cattle to oil, the geographical regions concerned shifted from the Pacific Northwest to the Sierra Nevada. Even the words used to characterize opponents in the debate shifted from the charge of, of environmentalists as zealots and kooks that flared over debates over the Alaska pipeline after 1973 to a new idiom after 1990 that emerged with Newt Gingrich's coordinated plan of attack on liberal strategies in which the activists were labeled as elitist and extremist, a strategy associated with Republican strategist Frank Luntz and the famous 1990 memo, Language, colon, a key mechanism of control. The language shifted again after 2000 in a push captured by the rise of the bigram radical environmentalists, which exploded only after 9-11 as Republicans embraced the idea that environmentalist activists were terrorists equating their ideology with that of radical Islam. The principle of auditing allows us to zoom in on speakers who used phrases such as extreme environmentalism or wealthy environmentalists which is, were shown in the previous slide. Indeed, 90% of the bigram attacks on environmentalists in the previous graph came from only six speakers in Congress. We can point the finger, we can name names. Is it legally actionable? I don't know, but I'd love to know. <laughs> Indeed, the chart also suggests that well before Gingrich, Senator Ted Stevens of Alaska was already pioneering a rhetoric of mistrust. We can trace the turning points of Stevens' rhetorical history in detail by descending to the, the level of actual words in their context. From his coining of the phrase, extreme environmentalists, which he said about 70 times over his entire career in Congress, to sow mistrust against the defenders of Alaskan wildlife, against the Trans-Alaska Pipeline after 1973, through iterations in the 1990s and 2000s as he adjusts the rhetoric and takes on new targets. The project that I've just described is one of assigning blame, of identifying individuals and moments that tilted discourse against the common good and so delayed rational science-driven policy to protect the atmosphere. The career of individuals like Ted Stevens, Senator for Alaska, who weaponized rhetoric on behalf of the oil industry, raises questions about the degree to which public figures can be held responsible for their speech. Responsibility for shouting fire in a public theater was famously the limit of this free speech until the 1960s when the social science, sci sciences uh, began to understand language anew as a collective phenomenon. 
with the tools of text mining, analysts today can consolidate decades of evidence into a clear case proving individual agency in the manufacture of collective discourse. And it becomes facile to move from data-driven measurements of how the discourse changed to data-driven content analysis of how individuals shifted the debate. So the congressman who lies under oath is responsible to the courts. When we treat discourse as evidence, we raise questions about whether congressmen are also responsible when they routinely belittle public groups such as activists, scientists, or minority groups in such a way that rational debate of evidence is sidelined in favor of caricature. Auditing text, therefore, has manifold other applications in the study of geography, environment, and urbanism. For the audits applied to Congress are easily reapplied to individual state legislatures, city councils, courts, newspapers, journalists, corporate reports, and corporate communications. In the future study of geography and urbanism, text mining offers an emergent practice that will arm tomorrow's students with the to tools for holding collectives and individuals responsible. But not all information is textual, of course. And the war over rhetoric in America is only one scene of engagement. It often documents the workings of institutions far removed from the most vulnerable citizens and ecosystems. So let's consider another zone of data, the data that reports pollution and weather events across the global south. Now, the global south is notoriously underdocumented in terms of climate data and underprotected in terms of international governance. The vast majority of climate data is collected in the global north. Uh, meanwhile, 45% of agricultural climate emissions come from industrialized farms in the developing world, which largely don't produce the human food, but animal feed and fuel, often, often with enormous public subsidies behind them. At the same time, the global south is the place inhabited by the majority of the world's most food insecure communities, but also a site of much of the 85% of the world's food grown by small farmers, as we heard in the first panel, who face escalating threats from the era of climate change, including global speculative land grabs, strip mining, and activist assassinations. A rational world would hedge against climate change by protecting these small farmers who produce the world's food, as well as the ecologies in which they work. And while the agricultural technology network sent races to commodify data about productivity, weather, and disease, those farmers themselves need a different kind of data. What we could be tracking includes the data about those human-caused events that threaten farmers' livelihoods, food safety, and the ability to constrain carbon, including pollution events, strip mining, and activist assassinations that threaten to displace these farming communities. Some of that data is, of course, already uh, being collected, sometimes collected by the farmers themselves, usually without remuneration, usually without any official mechanisms to hold the perpetrators responsible. For instance, in the work of the nonprofit Global Witness, which tracks and has data of the farmer assassinations. Um, but such a world, so we can imagine a world in which an international information infrastructure, again, science fiction, could collect, store, analyze, and take action on the basis of these alternative data metrics. In the paper cited on the screen, what kind of information does the era of climate change require? I envisioned such a world where citizens would be paid to collect data on where the rainforest is being burned because the communities on the front lines of climate change were themselves being compensated. I imagined a future organ of the UN or FAO dedicated to enlisting communities, compensating them for the labor of collect collecting data, and housing the planetary tracking of emissions, pollutions, evictions, assassinations, strip mining, and displacement in a centralized repository where the data would be collected, transparent, analyzed, could be found, retrieved, revisited, and implemented for action by both participants, laboratory sciences, and other international actors. The analysis, of course, has to be actionable such that polluters can be held responsible to communities. So we need to imagine mechanisms for accountability, like the creation of international court mechanisms for tracking those perpetrators. 
Only under the umbrella of such a system of world government, of land, water, and atmosphere, could we imagine democratic ecology taking shape in the form of the robust, evenly distributed and accessible way that we heard bravely imagined in the first panel. In the third project, I propose a universal cadaster that outlines how academics trained in the humanities could directly contribute to a program of democratic ecology. Now, since the early modern period, Western surveying and cartography have been instruments of dispossession. But one of the most exciting as aspects of the current information revolution in the humanities is the accessibility of geospatial representation to relatively powerless groups and their representatives. In the last year, digital humanists at the Turing Institute in London have made available an algorithm that can scrape the text of maps and geolocate it. Applied to the maps of European settlement, such an algorithm could be part of a pi pipeline creating dossiers of documents showing a history of territorial occupation by every indigenous group that has been named by documentary observers. There are already nonprofits like Cadasta and Land Matrix that specialize in arming landless groups, displaced groups, and indigenous groups with lawyers who create such dossiers painfully, slowly, by hand, looking for evidence of occupation before displacement so that they can prove land rights, enforce it, and hold the land in the court. It's a one case at a time basis. But a betting collaboration of which I am part envisions arming the, those lawyers with automatically generated dossiers filled with the da data from historical documents the do with data about the rights of displaced people around the entire world a universal cadaster of occupancy. Next, let's turn our attention to Cuba and 530,000 acres of public land occupied in the 1880s by 6,000 families of squatters. The area was called the Rialengo Dieci Ocho. Rialengo means public land, Dieci Ocho is 18. In the aftermath of the 1920s, the squatters on this land claimed the title Precaristas del Estado, land occupants on state land, and they became renters of small lots of land from the state in return for taxes. According to Spanish law through the 19th century, these squatters had a right to occupancy. They could not be displaced. They owned the land. But by the 1920s, Cuba's sugar companies attempted to evict them with help from the army. The squatters resisted in the courts and won. We're looking at an excerpt from a Cuban newspaper from 1934 that describes the families as heroes fighting for their land. By the 1956, the Rialengo Ocho had achieved legendary status when the squatter community welcomed its newest residents, the Castro brothers, and the community was identified as a major outpost of the revolution. So I'm describing here the work of my friend and collaborator, Adriana Chira of Emory. In the proposed initiative to create a universal cadaster, Historians like Chira would work with data analysts to text mine millions of documents like this one that articulate the rights of precaristas and other squatter occupants of the soil and indigenous groups which lack title around the world. Now, Adriana and I plan to work with students to develop a new pipeline for working with the data of real estate property and text effectively scanning, digitalizing, and processing the documentary records of property ownership and occupation. So the idea here is to gather maps and text that document the history of displacement in the fine grain. Historians will assemble detailed cases from the documents beginning in Cuba and Puerto Rico and other locales where there has been massive displacement over time. And the advantage of working with this technology is the advantage of scale. The AI tools allow trawling local archives and newspapers for evidence of occupancy and displacement in the past, and thus assembling a thicker, more comprehensive, and inclusive dossier of occupation than that available on a one case at a time basis. After all, the lawyers at Cadasta and Land Matrix can only do so many cases at a time, and that funding funds mainly lawyers trained and working in the developing world rather than the communities themselves. Uh, footnote, ask me questions about digital humanities views on 
labor in the developing world. There's a way to do this project with minimal labor in the developed world and most of the labor and funding happening on the ground in Puerto Rico, for example. I only know this because of the work of uh, scholars of color in the digital humanities, such as Alex Hill at Yale, so much respect to them. Uh, the goal would be to reinvent the ancient European cadaster, creating a new technology sensitive to the history of evidence and displacement, which uses the ineffaceable power of blockchain technology to create a lasting record of inhabitation. In conclusion, my hope is that these three projects give a glimpse of an emergent practices of a kind that can be adopted and taught anywhere in the world where data is valued, which is most of our universities, and where spatial practices are taught, which is wherever you teach. While not every practitioner of spatial politics is also literate in data, classrooms open to students with coding skills can become laboratories for applying those skills in new and meaningful ways that can result in large and lasting reforms. Participatory projects for gathering, analyzing, and making actionable data of this kind can help to educate data literate citizens who understand the stakes of environmental governance and who can retool the cloud of meaningless data that is a marker of our time into a world where data is al aligned with human values such as diversity, accountability, and transparency. That was brilliant. Thank you so much to all of you. And I think we can just go straight to, to questions. So who'd like to kick it off? And remember to identify yourself. Hi, um, I'm Nina. And I guess I'm in SIGU staff, an incoming sociology student here. Um, but yeah, I'm. I'm really like, this was one of the most exciting panels I've seen in a really long time. And I can already tell I'm going to be rewatching the recording just to pick up on some of these small details. Um, but I specifically have a question around trees and the Arboreal Intelligence Project. My own work deals with urban street treat planning. And I guess I'm really excited about the way that your work kind of interrogates these categories of public and private, especially because this kind of sensual experience of forests is so ingrained with a lot of the implementation of these strategies. Um, and I'm wondering, I guess, how, uh, how you see the kind of the possibilities for art or the humanities or this kind of new study of material culture to reveal more about the way that we use space and place and you know even the kind of small gaps and spaces on the street where these trees are planted hi thank you so much um my question is for joe i thought your presentation was so interesting and um, specifically with regards to this first item about the congressional speech, um, you talked about discourse as evidence, and it made me feel like the point of it was to, you know, hold these guys accountable in a court of law, which my own personal viewpoint is that it sucks if they use this rhetoric, but they should be allowed to because of free speech. But then I was starting to think of what else could you do with a tool and method like that? Um, and I was wondering if the data is abundant enough to correlate um, the rhetoric with particular outcomes, if people are trying to do that, either in the research world or I imagine at these big tech companies, they're trying to figure out what phrases are effective and what outcomes they have and sell that data to you know, Republican strategists or whoever, we must, there must be a huge industry in this by now. And I was just curious if you had any insights into how that was going. Um, so, so, so that's, it's very interesting. I, I'm, uh, it's a very interesting question, the link between rhetoric and outcomes. Uh, and I'm very curious um, that it's not part of my work so far, but it's an excellent question. Um, 
so what I'm presenting here, the question of outcomes and responsibilities, it's, it's something that I haven't floated before. It's not what, part of what I float in the description. It's merely a historical description of the attacks on, on environmentalists. But because this is a speculative panel, I could take a leap and, and ask, are there any lawyers in the room? <laughs> Does that even make sense? And I'm re really genuinely curious. So if you have an opinion on that, feel free to, to, fra to offer an opinion by, in, instead of a question. Um, in terms of big tech companies looking for outcomes, I mean, big tech companies have notoriously been looking at ways of grabbing eyeballs and measuring it. But I think actually there's a perception that um, that there's a perception that language technology is way ahead of where it is. Uh, because of large language models and all of the projections that have been placed on them, that's a much lar larger talk. But Emily Bender and uh, Tim Gebru are right. Like we just have monkeys armed with swords. We have stochastic parrots. They don't actually know what they're saying. And we don't actually know what to do with it. And in fact, what we risk as a nation using is a technology that generates, they're not hallucinations. They're just outright fabrications and falsehoods because the technology cannot summarize. The technology cannot tell you accurately what's in the text. Uh, traditional text mining can, and it's not well used, understood, or investigated. It's actually in its infancy. The work, the most serious work being done on language is being done in the digital human humanities. And the digital humanities are poorly concentrated in a handful of universities and have no overlap in Silicon Valley. Let me stress this, they do not know what they're doing. There are companies that sell videos and you think they, they boast about their data. They have a lot of data. They do not use text as data. You would think that if your, if your corporate model for selling plots, you might use the text as data, they don't use it. So we don't actually know that much about the effect of weaponized speech. And I agree, there, there are bad paths that this could go down. You don't, want to, you don't want to hold people responsible for every word that comes out of their mouth that would limit free speech, but is a concerted campaign like Newt Gingrich's campaign to tarnish all environmentalists as extremists, is that actionable? I don't know, again, I'm, I'm very curious about how to think about this. Should I go ahead? Okay. Um, I think Shaway probably has a lot to say about this too, being a practicing artist, but I'll just start by saying that I have heard over between last night and today so many repetitions of the terms messaging, framing, uh, rhetoric, story, narrative has come up repeatedly, finding appropriate uh, story or narrative to frame an issue, to appeal to particular populations, whether they be farmers, uh, small farmers, or I don't know, various activist groups. And obviously the arts and humanities has a huge role to play there. So I know this conference is about how can you bring together folks from the sciences with the humanities and social sciences. I would say the artists and the designers should actually be an integral part of that as well, because they not only provide for the means of translation between, the, in many cases, between these different different populations, how can you use maps or visualizations or what uh, uh, Susan Lee Starr calls boundary objects, things that are kind of uh, legible to different communities so they can rally around to have a discussion, even if only to just realize that they're talking, using different words for the same thing or uh, using the same word but it has different meanings. But if you have a thing to come back to, it's kind of like that implosion method I was mentioning before. We have a thing to keep coming back to that has some currency in each of your different professions or discourses. It allows you to figure out what your, what your kind of commonalities and frictions might be to productively work through them. So, um, and then not only in uh, the folks who are kind of on the side of affecting social change or environmental change, um, I, the arts and humanities are also very important in reaching out to various communities as well. All the different stakeholders that have been mentioned here and last, um, today and last night. Um, but then in terms of, um, also participation, going to Joe's uh, comments. I think that especially deploying media effectively. Um, my first book I wrote about, a, uh, I went around the country and looked at various cities who've designed new public library buildings and wanted to see how they designed the public process by which they engage different communities to do that. And I found that the, a, a disastrous deployment of media could actually really ruin a project. Like some cases used um, photorealistic images or um, a kind of uninterpretable models that a public didn't know how to make sense of that essentially shut down conversations. Um, so in this 
lost my microphone. Uh, uh, so I think that especially going to, when we're talking about participation, I'm um, using the sensibilities of arts and humanities, I think are really integral to um, um, uh, effectively engaging different communities as well. I'll just say one more thing because you mentioned street trees um, specifically. I'm not sure if that was uh, kind of a, a part of the larger question, but I was at Parsons School of Design for 18 years before moving to Penn, and I can't tell you how many students projects I have where people are like using the street tree as an uh, kind of a, 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 um, a launching pad for a thesis project or doing performance work around street trees. So there is, at least in my universe, so much interesting public art happening around street trees, which are a very charismatic and beloved object. Um, so I'll just stop there and see if Jawa has anything you want to add. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm like so many thoughts and tie-ins with what both of you have said. I mean, I think you know, there's a way in which when I feel like as artists, when we say like storytelling, people are like, oh, that's like woo woo stuff. Like, give me like, you know, the like charts and like the things and the policy. And actually, you know, like this past week, I was sitting um, down at McCormick Place, like researching um, the confluence of health tech stuff. And one of the biggest industries is around change management, right? Um, and what that is, is essentially people go in and like try to address like company culture, but also culture of various places. And so it's like culture is so central to the ways that we're going to like be moving and having strategies and solidarity and you know forming community participation <clears throat> engagement and change right and I think artists are integral to that um, and I think the other thing that I would say is you know to this idea of tech like I think you know all three of us are so invested in thinking about technology as not just the tool itself but engaged in its context and I think what dominant tech really does is that it's often like okay this is just a tool and then it's also this like political economic product in which it's containerizing inequality, right? Um, and I think some of the practices that both you two have talked about are really good examples in which that is not just a container or kind of outsourcing inequality, but actually um, ways to directly engage community and address it. Uh, thank you. Hello? Okay. Thank you for a wonderful panel so far um, and a wonderful day so far. I'm Derek from University of Illinois, Chicago. I had a question around the open access to data and uh, AI and basically how institutions could either weaponize or hide access. And I was thinking about this as, you know, open data, local governments became more popular and the early 2010s, but now it's if you do a FOIA request, you'll get a block of ininterpretable Excel spreadsheets. <laughs> so thinking about how moving forward, if you know we as educators and activists challenge institutions, they either make the data unavailable or make it you know AI software becomes you know six figures to access things like that. So I guess how can we think about addressing that, since we're speculating, uh, that, that potential challenge? Thanks. Hi, I'm, I'm Pauline. Um, and I guess, it, I hope it's going to be question less than a, a comment, but it's for um, all of you. And I think, you know, we expected a, a panel on speculative <laughs> geographies. Was that the title? Um, but I think the surprising part of um, all of your talks in some way is also, so, you know, your question was about interpretation and the power that that can have. Um, but a lot of what you talked about also had something that it's maybe hard to name, but, you know, you were talking about intimate, um, I think, what was the... <laughs> Sorry? Intimate. Intimate geographies, thank you. Uh, but then also you use charismatic a lot. Um, and then also, Joe, you told us that what you were doing was science fiction, uh, which is a bit different from speculative, but maybe not. And so I wondered if you could speak more to how you would conceive of your own uses of these, I don't know if you should call them affects of, or, um, you know, frameworks, uh, but just these more, more immaterial ways of thinking about what you're doing. Um, is there...
My question is to Shaoui, and I um, I was struck by the um, the uh, dominance of rain and moisture in your video, and um, when you talked about how they transform the kimonos to the actual, you know, the new place and the new uh, suitable clothes, so I think they probably Hawaii gets far less rainfall than than in Japan, even though for my environment it's still a lot of rainfall. But I, I don't know how that transformation of, you know, climate and rain also worked in the image of this community, imagination of these communities in shaping that kind of desire and intimate landscape and the memories and how they envisioned. Also, when I was looking at that really bountiful floral patterns in the in the clothes, I thought that if if this is something that was this difference was something that played a role in shaping the local community's memory. Um, I guess I can start from this end um, this time. Um, to the question of rain and moisture, there's so much there. I think the image that I will um, share is um, a lot of the plantation clothes, there's actually all this like red mud. And so because um, sugarcane takes an insane amount of water, um, there is like all these like vast irrigation canals. And so of course, like the fields, they like are very muddy. And so um, if you go to the archives, uh, Barbara Kawakami has kept the shoes of these plantation workers and they're all caked in mud. And so an, a theme in a lot of these songs is this kind of contrast, right? Between like the dryness in other parts of the island and then this mud um, and sugar cane um, that is there. So I think that's, that's an image that really stuck in my mind. Um, and then think to the question of open source and access Oh, that's like something that I wake up and I think about like every day. And I think something that I am curious to hear from both Shannon and Joe more about is also, I mean, it's a question of also relationship to the state and state power, right? Um, and I don't know. It's a question that constantly I feel like involves a lot of skillful navigation because it is like open source from who, uh, open source to whom. Um, I actually there was a recent panel on Monday um, about the cyber feminist index um, that was based in LA. And one of the panelists, um, A.M. Dark, who is created the open source Afro hair library, um, she talks about how open source itself has so many deeply problematic labor practices, as Joe um, touched upon. And it's like, well, things can be open source and they can also be open source for a specific community, right? So in her case, um, for her, the library is open source only to black folks. And so I think that's also maybe like these different um, threads, like as we engage more in this open source conversation that I think is really powerful and important to talk about. Um, and of course, also like, I could talk about like relationship to the state forever, but. <laughs> I just note also that, um, uh, just picking up on what Shalway said about the fraughtness of terms, op openness and transparency, as if they're inherent goods. There's been a lot of research that argues that you know, um, transparency can be avoided, especially by the microphone. Now it's totally gone. Kafka wrote a book about the history of paperwork. Perfect last name to write a picture, a book about the history of the paperwork. But he's arguing how, especially um, in French history, the the um, deluge of paperwork provided by the state in the name of transparency is actually a way to flood people with data and render them impotent. So we can see that on, in digital kind of context as well. Providing, if you, you ask for, I remember in New York City they wanted to provide an audit of, uh, speaking of audits, of algorithms. One of the city council people wanted a list of all the algorithms used in city government. I don't think he had any idea what he was asking for. There, that would have been a case of transparency is actually completely disempowering because they don't, they can't deal with the data. of data. They wouldn't know how to interpret it anyway. That said, on the flip side, maybe the more hopeful side, um, 
Uh, Joe mentioned Public Lab. I've worked, and I'm on the board of the Metropolitan New York Library Council, working with all the libraries in New York City and a lot of the archives. They're a trusted knowledge resource. I mean, if you look at people's, again, going to quantified uh, measures of affect, um, they're among the most trusted public institutions in most parts of the United States in particular. And they are the, uh, some more progressive libraries that are well-funded, not all are. Some cities have closed a lot of their libraries because they're not well-funded. They have served as a really important public pedagogy role. They're often the um, liaisons with open data initiatives, with the development of kind of public service technologies. This is something Ethan Zuckerman has written really interestingly about. Finding really fruitful partnerships between different trusted public institutions. Higher ed and public libraries is something I want to do more of at Penn. So that's one institution that I think provides both education for how to use these resources, and if they're also the repositories of some of these resources, they tend to be more on an ethical form of openness than if they were kind of if they um, were harbored by kind of a commercial institution or those with different a different every institution has an agenda but um, but I feel like librarians in particular tend to have a really critical um, understanding of openness and transparency unlike the other examples I was mentioning before well to the question about open data um, you know one of the fa features of the of the efforts at open government data uh, of 10 years ago is that a lot of them, almost all of them focused on making metrics, numerical data, budgets, counts, those kinds of metrics uh, available to the public. So it's, it's, in a sense, it's not surprising to me um, that one result of that is unintelligible spreadsheets without context. Um, I've come to it through text mining because I, my training is in a world of text where text is where we argue about concepts and decide and lay out plans and the words of the language of government documents is very important. Um, and going to a, even any, going to those uh, websites of cities that seem to be leaders in open government and open data is absolutely fruitless in terms of sharing text. Now, that's not universally true. We can find examples of people who are posting their city council reports. Some of them are better than others. Um, the Dallas City Council minutes uh, never identify the speaker, summarize an hour long speech in a single sentence. Uh, the Houston City Council minutes are better. Uh, there are state legislatures that have their debates online. There is no lab that's trying to collect the text and prove that it's text money. I mean, we're, we're trying to do this, but we're like two people without a budget right now. Um, uh, we're make, we've, we've designed a browser, a public facing browser to allow individuals to browse the speech of Congress or the UK Parliament into which you could plug all of that data from other institutions were it available. But one of the problems, you know, we've written grant after grant to the NEH and NSF and been turned down. We've heard that politicians and public funds hate funding this kind of grant because politicians hate being studied. So don't even try. Um, uh, so, so, but I, you know, I think it could be done, and I think, to Shannon's point, I think that it's there's work to be done in listing journalists and enlisting artists in understanding why it's important to audit the speech of your local city council. Who said that we needed more cops on the street, or that we needed, or that solar panels weren't important? Or who said that? When, even if it's not legally actionable, that information is data which drives decisions. Um, and then to the, I, I love the question about what speculative scholarship looks like uh, rather than descriptive scholarship, critical scholarship. Uh, for me, the appeal of data, of working with data, is the promise of speculation. And I've been thinking about that since you asked your question. Why is it that I've, you know, in, in recent, only in recent years I've been able to introduce myself as a data science scientist. I have degrees in literature and history. I spent a lot of my life not as a data scientist, as somebody who wrote histories of people who use data, often very skeptical histories of people who use data to manipulate other people, which actually makes me a great data scientist, let me tell you. Um, so, I, you know, I think I, I started to struggle in that work with what I was doing, what, where my concepts were going. And I was longing in a way for collaborations. And I had available collaborations with certain activists and certain artists, but I really had a kind of envy for you know, our friends in agroecology who, who have data sets and practices which then go out into the world and they're used and perhaps they haven't transformed all of industrial farming yet, but they have transformed lives and they've transformed the way 
the way land is used in the present and they have potential to do much more in the future. And I see this work in data as having a similarly aggregative effect what those of us with training in the social sciences understand, we understand how governments are run, we understand how collectives are run. When we work with data and repack, insist on repackaging our own data sets, as well as critiquing, of course, but repackaging our own data sets, there is an opportunity for this, this fermentation with communities that can adopt new practices. And data perhaps is not the only way to do that, but I, I think we should be curious and speculate about collective change that can change systems because uh, you know, our, friends, our friends need support in order to tra transform the world. And uh, this work deserves, to be, deserves a better hearing. I think also it's important to consider the politics of speculation. There's been some really good critique, self-critique within the whole world of speculative design over the past decade or so, getting who gets to speculate, to what ends. Um, speculation and futurism has been co-opted by consumers in many cases you know there have been research about how um, a lot of a lot of um, consultants uh, you know use Deleuze and Guattari and other kind of French critical theorists to think or not French theorists and critical theorists to kind of inform or to, to market a lot of the um, uh, projections and recommendations they offer um, and I um, gosh, I lost the next train of thought, but I just I think it's probably in line with what I was saying earlier about thinking about what openness and transparency means, think about what speculation means, also recognizing that there are going to Xiao Wei's point earlier about the different community boundaries around openness. I think it's important to recognize that there are different regionalism speculation. You know, you look at all the different prefix to futurism, there's Afrofuturism, there's Gulf Futurism, all of which are really informed by the placeness or the specific kind of subject positions of different communities. So realizing that there are different kind of um, practices, politics, motivations, methods of speculation that happen in these different communities can be a really productive way to recognize the ethical dimensions of what you're doing, to maybe borrow some ideas from elsewhere uh, when that's productive without being extractive. Um, so that's... Uh, yeah, I'll stop there. Yeah, and I think just to very lastly add on, I think that, you know, community is that kind of central thing, right? So when I think about openness and also speculation, um, I think a lot about like, you know, kind of the, the opposite of Hayek's autonomy is very much these questions of community self-determination and sovereignty. And I think that's kind of the key in those lines of like, what is open source doing, right? And what is that speculation doing um, versus when it's like Peter Thiel being a futurist and telling us how things are going to happen versus um, community ways of knowing and speculating. I think on that, uh, set of reflections, we've got a pretty good blueprint of the task laid out for not just Sigu, but all of us. So thank you. <laughs> thank you for throwing down the gauntlet. This has been absolutely fantastic. It's a, it's a real privilege to, to have you all present these thoughts to us. So please join me in, in thanking our, our panelists. <laughs>